This time we're going to be looking at the end of Book 6 of The Republic and the Book 7 of The Republic. Uh, and we're going to be continuing the study we began last time, basically of the nature of the philosopher. More specifically, uh, we're going to be thinking about what, what it is to grasp the nature of reality. Uh, and that study is going to take us through uh, what are probably the most famous parts of The Republic, uh, the images of the sun, and the divided line from the end of book six and the image of the cave from the beginning of book seven. Uh, uh, but before we get into the material that's discussed in those images, I want to begin by looking at what Socrates talks about right after uh, the image of the cave. He talks about the studies that people are going to have to go through if they're going to become philosophers uh, with Glaucon. Uh, and in the context of that, he introduces a very powerful notion. Uh, he, he talks about these things that he, that he calls summoners, things that summon the intellect, parakaleo. And so I want to begin by looking at this notion of summoning the intellect, uh, and then we'll turn to the material in those images. So this discussion of what it takes for someone to come to be a philosopher uh, begins with Socrates asking Glaucon at 521c, uh, do you want us now to consider in what way such men, philosophers, will come into being? Uh, Glaucon says, how could I not? Uh, and he says, well, well, then mustn't we consider what studies have such a power of uh, turning someone to think about the nature of reality? So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and so he asked Glaucon a series of questions. Uh, would it be this? Would it be this? And Glaucon uh, dismisses many kinds of study. And we'll come back and look at that conversation later because it's another one of those conversations where I think Glaucon gives the wrong answers. Uh, but anyway, Glaucon eventually says, uh, and yet, uh, what other study is left now separate from these uh, to, to do this? And Socrates says, well, if we have nothing left to take besides these, let's take something that applies to them all. And uh, Glaucon says, what do you have that's going to do this work for us? And Socrates says, the lowly business of distinguishing the one, the two, and the three. I mean by this succinctly, number and calculation. Um, so that's what he's going to talk about is the study, the study of number and calculation as this thing that's going to um, be the foundation for a philosophical relationship to reality. Uh, and so that's what we're going to go on and talk about. I, I want to start just by noticing one word. He says uh, the lowly business of distinguishing the one and the two and the three. Uh, distinguishing is uh, dia gignoskein, and it's just one of many words in here that have a dia prefix, uh, which means through. And I mention that because, you know, I was talking about kathorao as, as seeing through, and I think there's the, the theme of through comes up a lot in here. And so distinguishing these things is, is kind of a version of that, right? When, when you take uh, a range of things and you distinguish within it certain things, uh, you're seeing through that whole two distinctions that are available and so on. Uh, anyway, uh, I just want to note that notion of the dia or the through that's coming up here. Anyway, let's go on now and talk about what Socrates says about uh, number and calculation. So to get into that talk of number and calculation, Socrates begins by using that verb, katharao, and he says, uh, can you make this out? Can you catch sight of it? Um, that some objects of sensation do not summon the intellect to the activity of investigation because they seem adequately to be judged by sense, while others bid it in every way to undertake a consideration because sense seems to provide nothing healthy. Uh, that's at 523 A and B. And Glaucon says, uh, what do you mean? And Socrates says, the ones that don't summon the intellect are all those that don't at the same time go over to the opposite sensation. But the ones that do go over, I class among those that summon the intellect when the sensation doesn't reveal one thing any more than its opposite. So that's that's the thing he's now going to define as as a summoner, something that in the experience of perception, aesthesis, uh, is no more one thing than its opposite, and it summons up the intellect basically to figure that out. That's that's rough, roughly what it's going to mean. 
Uh, and so then he gives this example. He, he says, you know, take take your three fingers here, and you, uh, let's pick. Let's take these three. They're easier. I can ask about this this finger here. Is it big or little? Well, it's bigger than this one, but it's little in comparison with that one. So it's big and it's little. It's both big and little. Uh, but big is the opposite of little. Big and little are, are two. Each of them is a separate one. And this thing seems to be both. So that's kind of paradoxical. You see that and you think, well, I'm going to have to think about what the nature of the big and the little is. Uh, to make sense of how I can talk about a finger as being both at the same time. And he says, it's likely that in such cases, a soul summoning calculation and intellect first tries to determine whether each of the things reported to it is one or two. Well, you should certainly recognize that that language is highly reminiscent of the way he talked about uh, the beautiful and the ugly, the good and the bad, the just and the unjust, uh, near the end of book five. Uh, but, but anyway, in any case, he goes through that and he says, uh, in order to clear this up, the intellect was compelled to see big and little, not mixed up together, but distinguished, doing the opposite of what sight did, uh, aesthesis did in seeing these things together. Um, so the thing I want to uh, get at is, or, or the thing I actually want to focus on there is just a little bit of the language, right? So he says, what is summoned is calculation and intellect. And then later he says the intellect was compelled to see big and little, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, uh, we talked before about logismos, calculation, uh, and I was saying that uh, you know Socrates earlier points to calculation as this thing that indicates something that's going on in your soul. It's not the same as epithumia, desire, or the spirited part, the thumoides part. Um, but I was asking, you know, was, is, is calculation really a satisfactory way to construe that part of us? And, and I was saying, no, that really we have to recognize the presence of noose, which is the ability to grasp certain kinds of reality as such, and that that's, in a way, what informs calculation. Well, that's very much what he's saying here. You summon calculation and uh, intellect, logismos and noesis, uh, are, are summoned up. And the thing is, in order to calculate, which is roughly to say, in order to count, you actually have to be able to recognize what one and two are, what big and little is, and, and be able to determine that on the basis of which you will go on to do your counting and your calculation. Uh, so the, the power by which you make this grasp is noose. And, and he describes that at 527 D and E. Uh, he refers to a certain instrument of everyone's soul, uh, one that is destroyed and blinded by the practices that is purified and rekindled in these studies. An instrument more important to save than 10,000 eyes, for with it alone is truth seen. Anyway, that's, that's noose. That's his description of this capacity we have to be able to recognize you know the as such as i was saying before and i want to carry on with that right we were, he was talking before about these uh, the the lowly study of distinguishing the one and the two and the three or counting and so on right? well you're dealing with with uh, these you know numbers as such and so he says what we're talking about there uh, is those numbers that admit only of being thought and can be grasped in no other way uh, which is a little different from uh, the practice of you know buying and selling where you say this is going to cost you this much or this much money minus this much money equals a certain amount like yeah of course you rely on those numbers all the time when you calculate in the sense of uh, figuring out the cost of something but you use your grasp of those numbers to figure things out but you can also turn to the grasp of those numbers as such and notice them on their own terms. And that's what you would normally do in the in the more or less pure study of mathematics, right? You would turn to those numbers that admit only of being thought, right? Because you're never going to find one as such. You're going to find something that's one, one cow. But that one is also four. It's a four-legged beast. It's also two, you know, it's uh, old where it used to be young or, or it's got a left side and a right side, whatever, right? Remember before... When he was talking about beauty and the good and so on, he was saying, like, these things uh, always appear many. 
in their communion with bodies, right? Well, numbers like that too. Anything that is one, any existing thing that is one is also not one. It's also two and three and many and, and whatever else. Uh, so you never find pure one. So whenever you're seeing something as one, you're seeing something that itself is not unambiguously one. But what you're seeing about it is how it can be taken as one in light of your grasp of what it is for something to be one. So, you know, little children can count, but they didn't learn what it is for something to be one. They relied on a grasp of number that they inherit just by being human beings. Uh, and they rely on that kind of inheritance that is your nature as a person, your nature as a being with noose. They rely on that to be able to answer your question when you say, how many things are here? And so the study of mathematics uh, is taking people from counting simply to thinking about those relations of the pure numbers. right? So that's already a move from the... Uh, the world of becoming the you know we distinguish those two kinds of actuality the the actually existing processes of uh, realizing reality uh, we distinguish that from the actuality of being which is you know what it is to be one or, or something like that and when you are studying pure math you're not studying any processes of coming into being or passing away you're studying being you're studying what it is to be one what it is to be two so so the study of mathematics as opposed to the simple practice of calculation is moving to that domain of the actuality in the sense of being the as such that is grasped by intellect it should be the case or it, it could be the case at least that you recognize whenever you count that you're saying one about something that isn't one. That one is just as easily two, and you could recognize that your counting depends on your appeal to something that is not actually realized fully in that thing you're perceiving. Uh, but normally we don't ask that. Normally we just rely on that inheritance and without even thinking about it, like those uh, men, he said in book four, who are looking for what's already in their hand um, and they forget to learn from themselves. There we were reminded that you can already have something that you're, that you're sort of using, or in the case of the example, grasping that you're not noticing. Yeah, the, the fact that we've grasped what one is already can escape our notice. But uh, every time you count, there is an invitation to you to notice something, right? Namely, that there's a disparity between the thing you're calling one and what you're calling it, namely one. And the disparity is that that thing, precisely because it, it isn't really one, is insufficient on its own to give rise to that very meaning by which you're defining it, or in terms of which you're interpreting it or recognizing it. And just as you think, hmm, uh, there, there's more in my experience of this thing as one than what it offers, there's also more in your mind than uh, what you offer. Like you grasp these things that you didn't earn. Right? So, all, every aspect of that experience should be a kind of summoning. Uh, so back in book four, uh, Socrates gave the example of a man who's standing still but moving his arms. And the question is, is that person one or many and so on? Uh, and he says, couldn't, couldn't we refine this even more? He says, if the man who gives us this example should become still more charming and make the subtle point that tops as holes stand still and move at the same time when the peg is fixed in the same place and they spin or that anything else going around in a circle on the same spot does this too we'd say that they have in them both a straight and a circumference 
and with respect to the straight they stand still since they don't lean in any direction while with respect to the circumference they move in a circle so let's look look at a spinning top right? you notice that when it spins um, it's it's going around in the circle and it's maintaining a straight axis right? uh, in the case of my top because I didn't do it perfectly it does that wobbling left and right but the, the thing you can notice is that there's a kind of uniform reality that's being moved like you, you're seeing this spinning circle that's wobbling if it weren't wobbling you would just see a spinning circle that basically stays the same uh, the axis stays the same and the circle stays the same through the motion what I want you to notice about that example is that you can't recognize that phenomenon you can't make sense of that phenomenon without really relying on the notion of line and circle right you see it as a circle revolving around a line so quite a bit like the issue of counting ones where you rely on the notion of the one we could say that circle and straight are the very possibility of the spinning top what makes it possible for there to be that phenomenon that that phenomenon in other words the what of what you're seeing is defined by line and circle but the thing itself uh, that's there the the actually existing little bit of reality isn't uh, either a perfect circle or a perfect line so it's like the issue of counting the ones it's it's again a case of you recognizing something as defined by as as being a realization of something it doesn't actually measure up to something it, it isn't it is insufficient on its own to present to make present to make real the spinning top then is itself a kind of announcing of a reality it's defined by but is inadequate to it announces a reality it's defined by but that exceeds it right so the the the, the spinning top it is again a kind of pointer a kind of summoner right it's something that uh, to the extent that you recognize it is already drawing your attention to something else that's going on in you and something else that's going on in reality let's just talk a little bit more about that that top right like so it it is like in a basic way you want to say well it is a circle but it, it's not exactly a circle but but that's that's what it's sort of in the process of being or trying to be it's it's like it's it's circling it's like it's it's existing is its process of announcing circle of doing circle to the best of its ability so you remember we talked before about mimesis as you know when the poet sort of goes into direct speech and we talked about you know the actor in that case would be imitating if the actor like the poet is speaking as if he or she were the character they're enacting well there's something like that happening here it's as if the spinning top is is kind of the voice saying the reality of circle it's sort of as if it were that thing right it, it's like it's giving voice to that reality so it's it, in that sense it's like a kind of mimesis he call it calls uh, anything like this a mimesis and it's often translated as an imitation and that's not wrong but i think if you remember what mimesis meant in the context of our talking about poetry and i, I was interpreting it as kind of reenactment or, or sort of making the thing present i think you really see that more if you see this thing as sort of be speaking circle with its very existence right and same with straight it's like straighting so far as it's able and so that re should remind you again of that quotation from the end of book five where he says you know about beauty or or um, ugliness or good or whatever he said these things though one appearing everywhere in communion with bodies uh it appears many well that's sort of what you're seeing here you're seeing that circle you recognize circle all over the place circle is being realized all over the place but it's always being realized in that community with 
bodies and actions and so on, such that it appears many. And any of those things is the presenting of circle. It's reminding you that reality is defined in terms of circle, but none of them is simply identifiable with it. And so for that reason, every circle is also not a circle. Every circling is also a failure to circle, right? Just as he says, every beautiful thing is also not beautiful. So the spinning top again, like any example of counting, is uh, from the start a, a kind of an invitation to you to notice, noose, to notice that you are seeing things in light of your grasp of these various dimensions of what it is to be real. And that grasp of what it is to be real is not something you're learning in your experience of things. On the contrary, it's that by virtue of which your experience of things is being meaningfully presented to you. So at the end of book six, Socrates says, okay, let's uh, imagine a line uh, cut in two unequal segments, one for the class that is seen and the other for the class that is intellected. That's 509D. Uh, uh, so basically he's, he's picking up on the things that we've been talking about here and that we were already talking about before. Uh, he's picking up on this basic distinction between the ongoing process of coming to be and passing away that we perceive and the way that that experience is illuminated by the, the, a grasp we already have of certain dimensions of reality. So here he's, he's just going to, you know, make an image of that. When he says, you know, each, each the, the, the world of uh, perception and the world of what we grasp by noose, we can divide each of those into two parts as well. Uh, and, he, and he says, let's start with shadows. And, and what he's going to do is more or less talk about that same theme as, as we talked about when we talked about summoners. He says, think about what it is to perceive a shadow, right? On the one hand, you could say you see, uh, uh, let's say, a wall or a sidewalk or something concrete that's light in certain parts and dark in certain other parts. Like, you could have that experience, but that's not what it is to see a shadow. Right? You see it as a shadow when that disposition of light and darkness is something you recognize as caused by the presence of a body, right? So when you're there and you suddenly see a shadow, you say, oh, someone's here, right? The shadow is a way of making present some other reality. And so you you don't see light and dark as, as such. Like that's not the, those aren't the terms in which you perceive it. You say, oh, I see a shadow, right? To see it as a shadow is to see it as caused by that other reality. And of course, the shadow by itself, that disposition of light and darkness, is not at all sufficient to um, account for that reality. But on the other hand, that reality is what accounts for the shadow. Well, what he wants to now say is, yeah, he should be noticing that that same kind of relationship that you can grasp easily in relationship to a shadow also characterizes uh, further dimensions of your experience. So if you think of what that's a shadow of, namely a, a person who is behind you, you know, we commonly think, okay, now I've found the reality. That's the reality that was causing this uh, sort of uh, derivative presence. But then what he wants to say is, well, you know, what we can recognize, and we already have recognized this to a large extent, is that those th things that we see, the dog or the cat that's casting the shadow or the oak tree or whatever, those things in a similar sense are shadows, right? I, I gave this example, I, I think it was of the dog last time, uh, or of the tree, right? That you see it as a tree, as the same tree, even though it's constantly changing, going through different stages and so on. And you, you say, on the one hand, there is the actuality of the tree, and on the other hand, there is the actual changing stages of the thing, 
right? And so we distinguish two senses of actuality, the actu actuality in the sense of what it is, the being, and actuality in the sense of the process of becoming, of coming into being and passing away. Well, so similarly here, right, when you look at the thing that's casting the shadow and say it's a dog, you are basically seeing that process of, be you are basically seeing a process of becoming as a kind of shadow of a being, right? In and through all of the changes in the size and shape of the dog, uh, all the changing particular actions, all the differentiated body parts, the fur and the nails and whatever else, you're seeing the dog, same dog, right? And so uh, you are, again, you are again involved in a relationship of seeing two things, one that's kind of measured by the other, one that's kind of defined by that other, which is its possibility. Uh, but you commonly don't notice when it comes to talking about the dog that there are sort of two dimensions to that, that that's, that single recognition is a sort of process of holding together two recognitions, right? In the shadow, it's pretty easy to, to grasp it. You can say, yeah, I see it as a shadow. That means in that single recognition of it as a shadow, I am both perceiving a disposition of light and darkness on the pavement or on the wall and grasping the reality of a, of a different kind of thing that is not itself a disposition of light and shadow at all, but is the cause of that thing. Uh, and, and I'm seeing the light and dark in terms of that, right? You can easily recognize that inherent doubleness of the cognitive activity of the experience, right? Well, that is also happening when you see the dog, but you commonly don't recognize it. Uh, well, so anyway, in the case of the image of the divided line, he's saying, yeah, that's, that's what we are going to recognize now. So we're going to say in the realm of the visible, we can pretty easily recognize this distinction between the shadow and that of which it is the shadow. But now what we've already been saying as well is that the recognition of that of which the shadow is a shadow is also in a kind of analogous sense the shadow of something else in that the the visible is a kind of shadow of the noetic that which is grasped by noose and so that takes us then into the upper part of the divided line and so there he says there too there is a division so you know what's that first part of the upper division of the divided line well it's that of which the process of coming to be that is a dog is a kind of shadow or a kind of mimesis a kind of making present right and that's that's the the what it is of dog or or many other things uh, and so he says you know that here the first level the lower level so to speak of the intellectual part of the divided line is all the stuff we have so far been talking about th those familiar uh, realities, intellectual realities we rely upon. The circle, one, uh, dog, and so on. But now he says, there's something further you can, you can do. You can recognize all of those things are themselves articulations of the nature of what it is to be. And so again, we sort of made that point before too, right? So those things themselves are so many realizations of being as such. So we can go from recognizing these ideas we rely upon, one and circle and so on, we can go beyond noticing them as that which we have already grasped, such that we can recognize round things and single things, to uh, turning turning from them to saying, what what is it of which they are realizations? They are so many realizations of being as such, right? And so he says, uh, this is at 510C. I suppose you know that the men who work in geometry, calculation, and the like treat as known the odd and the even, the figures, three forms of angles, and other things akin to these in each kind of inquiry. These things, they make hypotheses, and don't think it worthwhile 
to give any further account of them to themselves and others as though they were clear to all. Beginning from them, they go ahead with their exposition of what remains and end consistently at the object towards which their investigation was directed. That's fine. And he says, well then, this is now jumping down to 511b, well then go on to understand that by the other segment of the intelligible, I mean that which argument itself grasps with the power of dialectic, making the hypotheses not beginnings, but really hypotheses, that is, stepping stones and springboards, in order to reach what is free from hypothesis at the beginning of the whole. So that's the point then that I was just making, right? That the, the geometer treats as known the one or the square or something like that. And, you know, those are these, you know, intelligible dimensions of reality that we use to make sense of other things. And we can talk about them on their own terms as the geometer does saying, you know, the square has three, or sorry, the triangle has three interior angles equal to 180 degrees or something like that. Uh, but the geometer is still relying on something. The geometer is relying on the notion of one or something like that as a kind of given, as he says. But in the same way that you can turn from shadows to the thing and from things to, from becoming to being in general, you can turn from these determinate intelligible dimensions of reality to asking of what are they the realization and presentation which, you know which would be the nature of being itself and that's then uh, moving to you know the what he, what he calls the top level of the of the divided line and so i want you to think about a particular thing there right notice in each case what we've been seeing is something such that we ask, you know, of what is this the realization? What is the principle that is its possibility, right? What, what is the nature of reality such that this realization is possible and so on? And uh, what we saw when we talked about that in relationship to the dog or in relationship to the city in the last lecture, what we saw is that the, the defining principle of the thing, the defining nature of the thing is also the norm to which it answers, right? It's, it's what the thing in, in a sense is, is trying to be, you know? So that, that's why Socrates says in relationship to the city, when you understand what it is to be a city, namely a assembly of a cooperative assembly of persons for the purpose of satisfying human needs, well, then you can look at any actual city and say, you know what, that's not doing a very good job of being a city because it's not uh, living up very well to its founding principle. You know, it's it's succeeding in these ways, but it's failing in these ways, right? So the the principle of the thing's possibility, that, that which is sort of its cause, is also that to which the thing answers, right? And a thing is good or bad, uh, to the extent that it uh, lives up to the demands of its defining nature. What that means is, in each case, the being of the thing is its good, right? The, that's, that's the relationship of the being to the becoming is the relationship of the good to that which is realizing it, and that is going to be good or not to the extent that it realizes it well and so on right so so every kind of being is a kind of good right and thus what it means to be in a deep sense is to be good to to be is to be a way of realizing the good right? if we've now recognized that though as as in a way the meaning of being and the, and the meaning of the different kinds of being, then, you know, using the same kind of thinking we've used before, we could say, so, so what makes being as such possible is the good. The good is that without which being couldn't be, right? Uh, but in that case, uh, the good isn't exactly a being or even a kind of being. As he says at 509b, the good isn't being, but it's still beyond being. Epicana tesusias.
Right? Being is because it is good that there be. So being, the, the fact that being is, is itself just kind of a spontaneous overflow of what it is for the, the good to be good. The, the good gooding is being. And so Socrates says, you know, the good rules over the intelligible as the sun rules over the visible. The sun provides what is seen with the power of being seen and also with generation, growth, and nourishment. And he says, the good is why things known are known, but, is, but also existence and being are in them besides as a result of it. Uh, and so he says then at 509D, conceive of these two things then, the one as the king of the intelligible region and class and the other as the king of the visible. And so then that's the comparison of the sun and the good. Well, I think I just gave some sense of why existence and being are in them as a result of it, the good. And thus why things are seen as what they are when they're seen in light of the good. So Socrates talks about the issue of the sun in relationship to sight. And he, he says at 507D, uh, don't you notice that the power of seeing and what's seen have a need for a third thing? Uh, he says, when sight is in the eyes and the man possessing them tries to make use of it, and color is present in what is to be seen, in the absence of a third class of thing whose nature is specifically directed to this purpose, you know that the sight will see nothing and the colors will be unseen. And that thing is light. Without light, doesn't matter if the color's there, doesn't matter if you have the native capacity to see, no sight is going to happen. And so he says, then the sense of sight and the power of being seen are yoked together with a yoke that is uh, more honorable than the yokes uniting other teams, namely the light. Uh, so I want you just to think about that situation. So first of all, notice that seeing itself happens only by a kind of uh, working together of the, that which is to be seen and that which has the power to see, right? So seeing doesn't exist without either of those. Simply having the power to see is nothing in the context of not relating to that which can be seen. And being that which can be seen, again, is nothing, at least is not, not vision, uh, unless it's in relationship to that which can see. But as he says, those two alone aren't enough. Uh, so light is what makes it possible for their shared actualization to be realized. Uh, so that structure is interesting. So first it's interesting because notice that there is a single reality there seeing, which is the kind of shared existence of two things that are defined as being kind of the opposites of each other, the seer and the seen, right? It's the relationship of these things that hold themselves apart as opposites. It's the being together of those things which are defined as opposites. That is the reality of seeing. That's what uh, Heraclitus in uh, fragment 51 calls a back-turning harmony, a, a palintropos harmoniae a back-turning harmony like the bow or the lyre, where you have a certain reality that exists only by a kind of internal tension of things that are united as their opposition to each other. That's the first thing to notice. Second thing to notice is that, you know, he's saying that works only in the presence of light. And as he says, uh, you know, the light is kind of the, just the, he says it's the overflow of the sun's treasury. Like, in other words, the sun, just in being itself, gives off light, right? And what is light? Well, it is it is the power that lets seeing happen, right? And so he says the, the sun isn't sight either, but, but as its cause is seen by sight itself, right? So he's saying it's in seeing that you can recognize that seeing is only possible because of light. There's, no, there's another way you recognize it. Like you might rely on intellectual powers for sure to understand things like cause or whatever, but the recognition is a recognition of something that's happening in sight. But notice this striking thing, right? You don't ever see the light, the illuminating by itself. What you see is the lighted, the illuminated, right? The illumination is manifest to you as the ability to see that thing. 
Right? So illumination as such is something recognized. You recognize it as the cause, but it is not itself another sighted object. It's something that, in fact, you only see through the seeing. Right? You, you, you see something, and in seeing it, you see that this seeing is the realization of a possibility. You see it as also something illuminated by light, by that overflow of the sun's treasury. So my, my point then is that notice that the recognition of light, the recognition of the illuminating power, is another version of that kathorao, right? It's something that has to be seen through. And it has to be seen through this palantropos harmonia. It has to be seen through this um, reality that exists only as the coming together of two further powers that uh, define themselves precisely as in opposition to each other. The good is like that with respect to the intelligible realm, with respect to that realm of the parameters of being as such, the familiarity with which is kind of our inheritance as beings with noose, like we, we grasp those things. And he says the sun, likewise, uh, it not only provides what is seen with the power of being seen, but also with generation, growth, and nourishment, right? The, the overflow of the sun's treasury lets what's seen be seen, but it's also what lets, you know, natural things grow and all the rest. Well, so he's saying, you know, the analogous thing about the good then is that it is what gives the very meaning to the things known. And it, it's what gives the very existence to those things that are, to those dimensions of being. So the, the point I want to bring out about that then is that, you know, there's a, there's a way that in seeing, you're always reliant on a kind of illumination, but you can see through the seeing to that power that makes it possible. Right? And he's saying a similar thing can happen here, right? You, you know, like the geometer uses these hypotheses, but you as a philosopher can go from those hypotheses and not take them as premises from which you're going to conclude things, but take them as that which is to be explained and try to understand them as articulations of what it is to be. And you really do that when you see through those experiences and, re and, and recognize them all as realizations of the good, right? And, you know, that's, that's basically then what we're saying about the, the way being presents itself. Nature is the way that being presents itself. Becoming, the, the world of coming into being and passing away, is the way that being presents itself. And you really grasp that when you see it as the domain of the good being realized. So let's think a little bit more about that recognition of the good, though, because that's in a way your highest recognition of things, your highest knowing of them, is to see them as ways of realizing the good. But that recognition of the good as the ultimate cause has further consequences, because to recognize the good as good, to, rec to recognize what it is to be good, is not just a cognitive affair. But you're not really recognizing the good as good if you aren't feeling the imperative to be good, right? Uh, that's what it means to recognize the good. So we were saying that there's a kind of knowing that is not just relying on the inheritance, which is your noose, your noetic grasp of the dimensions of being, but making that the object of your inquiry, right? That's what the philosopher does. And that would happen because things in your experience summon you to do that. By the very gap between anything you see and its nature or its meaning, you are invited, provoked, summoned to notice those things that are going on in your experience that are beyond just the terms of your perceptual life. Right? So anything in the perceptual world, precisely because it's, as, as he says, something that doesn't real, reveal one thing any more than its opposite. Right, We found that out already, that 
any one of the dimensions of being uh, in revealing itself in communion with bodies and practices and, and, uh, and other dimensions uh, will always be, you know, beautiful and not beautiful, good and not good, right? Itself and its opposite. So anything in the world of your perceptual experience uh, is in fact a summons to you to notice this dimension. You know, that that turning to investigate these things is, as he said in book four, a matter of learning from ourselves, right? What we were already doing. If you do that, if instead of treating the intelligible dimensions of things as given, you turn to them as things, as something to be understood, that inquiry uh, is really, the culmination of that inquiry is the recognition of the good. And that recognition of the good is a, a kind of moral turning as well, right? That recognition of the good requires of you that you then hold yourself answerable to the good, right? So what looks initially like a certain kind of cognitive thing turns out to be a deeply uh, practical thing, uh, a matter of uh, redefining who you are. So the turning ourselves around to learn from ourselves also then culminates in a kind of turning of the soul to answering to the imperatives of the good. And that's really then the experience of the philosopher. We've really seen that the uh, story of the philosopher is simultaneously the highest development of our knowing powers, uh, but it's also the fullest development of our moral powers. That's more or less what they said in, uh, in book six. And we can see here in a way how those two things come together, right? That the uh, recognizing the cause of things, which is kind of what knowing is about, in as much as that amounts to recognizing the good, uh, turns into, or or is completed in, uh, an attitude of answerability, right? Because recognizing the good requires you to feel yourself impinged upon by it. Book seven begins with this very famous image of the cave. And it is more or less the story of how we go from our everyday experience to uh, basically converting to philosophy. And one of the most salient features of that story is that it says that that change, that development is challenging. I mean, in a way that's not surprising because the very things we just said about answering to the good pretty much imply that, you know, this, this, uh, education is fundamentally a kind of transformation uh, so you have to change you know the so in, in a way the imperative of philosophy is that you got to change uh, so those those things are always challenging and uncomfortable uh, but the story of the cave uh, brings that out in a couple of particular ways that I want to emphasize and so the first thing is I want to go back to a, a question that Socrates asked Adamantus uh, in in book six uh, so you remember in book six, they were talking about who the philosopher is, what the philosopher's character is like. And that's where Socrates made this point that, you know, all these good things that go into making the philosopher's character, courage, moderation, strength, various other things, uh, are also uh, bad things that can destroy the person's soul if uh, they become ends in themselves, if they become... Uh, uh, roots by which the person comes to sort of celebrate himself prematurely and they can distract us or tempt us away from the fuller path to philosophy. So, so he says, you know, ima imagine a, a young man who has, you know, grown up in good circumstances that, that, that in principle could give him the resources for becoming the philosopher in this rich and full sense they've talked about, but that person has been uh, drawn into other activities by people sort of flattering him and whatever saying well you should do this you're really good at this or you should do this thing i like you're really good at that and so the person has come to deploy his excellent talents in poor ways uh and does that in the context of you know getting a lot of positive feedback from people who want him to do that and so socrates says 
was at 494D. Now, if someone were gently to approach the young man in this condition and tell him the truth, that he has no intelligence in him, although he needs it, and that it's not to be acquired except by slaving for its acquisition, do you think it will be easy for him to hear through a wall of so many evils? Uh, so uh, Socrates is saying, you know, um, you know, the, the point is you have something true you want to say to that person, but the very nature of that person's situation is such that uh, he he is very much predisposed not to be able to uh, hear the truth in what you're saying. So I want to talk about that point, and and also want to say something about that in relationship to the drama of this book. You know, you remember I said that it seems quite reasonable to think that the whole of the Republic is the portrayal of the conversation Socrates had with Glaucon, in which he essentially convinced him not to try to seek political office political power. Let me read you one more line from book seven that pertains to that. This is at 534D. You know, they've been talking about education and they've, they've been sort of imagining education, you know, they've been giving a, an, an account of it in speech. And Socrates says, well, as for those children of yours whom you are rearing and educating in speech, if you should ever rear them indeed, I don't suppose that while they are as irrational as lines, you would let them rule in the city and be sovereigns of the greatest things. You know, so it's just a comment that comes up in the course of their conversation for whatever reason. But he's saying, you know, if you actually weren't just telling stories, but you actually had the responsibility of truly taking care of someone, rearing someone, well, if you think that that person is kind of, uh, you know, irrational in some sense of that term, uh, you wouldn't uh, let them try to r rule and be sovereign in the city, would you? Uh, it seems to me... That sounds like Socrates talking about his relationship to Glaucon. He's saying he's not saying to Glaucon, but but he's sort of saying to the reader, or he's talking about this situation where he's saying, you know, uh, you you're uh, you got a lot to learn, and I think my responsibility is to try to stop you from trying to rule in the city. Anyway, so again, going back then to this question that he asked to Adamantus in Book Six, you know, how would you approach someone who you think has the wrong idea and so again it seems to me that sounds like Socrates approach to Glaucon so there I want you to think okay that if, if that's right then that tells you something about what's going on when you're reading this book right you're witnessing Socrates view about how he has to talk to this guy to let him know that he's got a lot to learn which doesn't amount to just coming out and saying, oh, you got a lot to learn, right? They go through it quite differently. Uh, and that may explain a lot of why things happen in the conversation where Socrates asks questions, Glaucon seems to me to give the wrong answer, and Socrates doesn't say that's the wrong answer. But instead, you know, he just works with what Glaucon says, gradually and gently trying to bring in the things that he really wants him to see. Um, so... Uh, I want to say that thing about Glaucon because I think that's relevant to the reading of the book and to the drama of the story. Uh, and I want to go back still and talk about the general point, but I want to say one more thing about that too, about something you should hear when you read this, right? Like he's saying, you know, imagine someone needed to be educated. They don't see that easily, right? So how would you tell someone they need to be educated? Well, it's relatively easy to look on at Glaucon and say, oh yeah, right, he's like that. But you have to ask that about yourself. Right. You got, when you're reading this book, you have to think you're the one who needs to be told something. And uh, it's challenging to tell you that. Right? So when you're reading this, you really need to feel, I think, personally impinged upon, cr critically impinged upon by the things that are being discussed here. Uh, anyway, so uh, let's just go back to the form of the story, though, and you can keep those thoughts in the background. So he says, what's it like to tell someone that they're, uh, they, they're uneducated and they need an education, right? They think they're really succeeding. And you want to say, yeah, you think you're succeeding, but you're actually losing. Now, how are you going to tell that person that? How are you going to tell them that such that they can hear it? Right, if you just say that sentence to the person, they're going to say, it's ridiculous, you know? You think, what's wrong with you? Right, and so that's kind of what the story of the cave is about. He says, you know, imagine someone is dragging you out of the cave. Like, you know, imagine you're in a cave where you've been seeing, you know, images on a wall uh, that are really the projections of puppets. 
but you don't know that you've never seen those puppets so you think this is reality you know so you're, you're quite uh, you you're quite mistaken about the nature of reality you're being manipulated by causes you haven't recognized so imagine someone who's figured that out comes down to tell you you know you you've been misled what's that like and again let me read a, a bit from book seven he says uh, what do you suppose he'd say if someone were to tell him that before he saw silly things well now when you're sort of taking him out and saying here's the truth well now because he's somewhat nearer to what he is and more turned towards beings he sees more correctly uh, don't, don't you suppose he'd be at a loss and believe that what was seen before is truer than what is now seen right so you know put that remark together with that other remark about what you're going to do when you see somebody who's uh, misguided right you know so think back to the discussion in book five you know uh, are you going to say to Glocon uh, you got a problem man thinking that you can just enslave these other people you know you got to recognize that they're human beings you know that doesn't really work and he, he tries it he says to Glocon all these other things about identifying uh, the sort of universal human capacities and Glocon claims to recognize them and yet he still thinks it's fine to enslave the barbarians um, so you know you think what what is it like when someone tells you that you're wrong about something um, think back also to Glocon at the beginning of book two you know he said you know uh, I sort of believe the things you're saying about justice are right but the arguments that Thrasymachus makes seem more compelling how am i supposed to deal with that right like you know we saw with glocon from the very start that he draws attention to this way that we can find different things convincing in different ways and it's not always easy to put those things together well you know so here if you have a sort of argument that tells you that people should all be treated the same way but you have you know this huge cultural habit of in the earlier part of book five saying that you know women shouldn't be able to do the same things as men or in the later part of book five saying that barbarians should be slaves uh you know you have a lot of deep familiarity with these views that make a lot of sense to you and that your whole world endorses and then you got this idea that someone has expressed that sort of you know makes sense as an idea but that speaks against all those things like which are you going to go with? Which are you going to trust? Right? That's not that's not straightforward. And let's read a little bit more, right? And you know, think about what's going to happen. So, you know, the issue is here. You know, someone has told you you're wrong. Well, you might not like it. Now, what if somebody drags you out to the light? Right? He says uh, at five fifteen e, and then the beginning of five sixteen a. Uh, and if someone dragged him away from there by force, uh, and didn't let him go until he dragged him to see the light. Wouldn't he be distressed and annoyed at being so dragged? Right, like even if someone's going to uh, make you see that you're wrong about something, how do you feel about that? Like maybe, maybe in this case, think about uh, an argument you have with someone. Uh, sometimes people can, you know, by pulling together stuff you've said or whatever, can show you that you're wrong about something, can force you to acknowledge that you're wrong. Uh, whether or not they're right to do that ask yourself about how it feels to to be put into that position right wouldn't you be annoyed at being so dragged you might be wrong to be annoyed but we commonly are you know so you know he asked this question in book five like how are you going to tell a young man that uh, he's misguided it's hard to hear it's not hard to hear acoustically it's not like there's something wrong with your ears it's hard to hear in the sense that it's hard to receive into your soul that assessment of who you are you know so another thing from the cave story you know he says what's it like uh, if uh, a person who has undergone a kind of transformation and seen the light so to speak uh, if that person is uh, put in the situation of having to compete with people according to their terms of everyday life right and he says you know so imagine in the story of the cave imagine there were uh you know it used to be a thing for people to look at the shadows and you know that the 
person they'd celebrate would be the person who could sort of guess well what what shadow was going to come next and so on the person who has gone out of the cave knows that they're just guessing it right? knows that there is a real explanation for what those shadows are but that explanation comes from understanding you know what's actually making them and the person who's guessing doesn't know that but so for that reason the the person who if, if the person who's seen the light if they're just compelled to sort of try to play the guessing game about shadows couldn't even really do it very well because they're being asked to play a game in a way that makes no sense uh, so that should remind you of the story of both the stargazing pilot and of the, the sophist sort of dealing with the habits of the great beast that we talked about in book six All right so the thing is there's a game of public discourse and there are people who have a knack for playing it well uh, the person with insight probably can't play it well because that because that person doesn't live and think by those rules and so again with this question of how do things look like how how does that person look to you when they try to drag you out will you get angry at them but also how does that person look in the in your environment does that person look you know successful and insightful no it looks like a, a bumpkin or something it looks like someone who can't make sense of anything compared to these other people who seem to be really good at it right so again you know when you read the story about the stargazing pilot you might think oh yeah yeah those sailors on the ship they're crazy to uh, mutiny and not accept a real pilot but i think the point here is like or the question here is would you notice a wise person among you or confronted with a wise person would you relying on the terms of public discourse com completely uh reject that person as a fool that at least whether or not that's true of you that at least again is the issue that the person is going to be confronted with the person who you know like like glaucon who's sort of misguided and someone's trying to enlighten them maybe socrates and let's go on to one part a little bit later at 538a to e basically they tell the story of the changeling child and that you know he's basically saying you know what's going to happen if in this certain circumstance you grew up thinking certain people were your parents and later you found out they weren't right uh so the, the details of the story aside uh the, the basic structure is just that you know you grew up all along believing in these people and then you find out you know in this case they that's that's not really what you were from they're not really your parents so the things that you have relied upon up to that point you now distrust so that's kind of like the next step in the story we were just talking about you know what if uh somebody initially tells you your views are wrong well you might not like it but even if you came to believe them even if you came to see that there was something wrong with the way things used to look to you that doesn't end the story so he says about the changeling child you know your parents were telling you this one thing but other people were saying no you should live another way you should live another way but you said no no i i believe in my parents they tell me this you know but then later you find out they're not really your parents so you don't trust them but all of a sudden the reason you had for not believing all those other people or the reason you were using was well because my parents say so well if you no longer trust your parents say so well there's you have no obvious reason not to go along with those people so he says when you become aware of this situation uh won't he now relax his honor and zeal for these people and intensify his honor and zeal for those flatterers right and so the point there is when we first have our well-established securities challenged or undermined that doesn't automatically propel us to the truth sometimes it just makes us could be a lot of things skeptical nihilistic whatever but it, you know it it can make us um sort of not trust anything or or think or maybe we think that well since the one reason i used to have for not doing a certain thing is no longer true i'm now going to say oh there's no reason for not doing that right so people can swing like that right so the the this goes back to the question how are you going to talk to a person uh who, and tell him he's misguided well one difficulty is that uh he might not listen but even if he listens that can be a problem because sometimes people uh, uh take the criticism of their old way but that doesn't mean they take good guidance into what the new way should be sometimes they are 
end up losing the one thing that was keeping them on a good path and they just get lost without it. And so so these discussions in the in the image of the cave and in some of these stories uh, that come after that um, in the talk about the education of the philosopher, it seems to me that Socrates is dramatizing quite effectively the psychological complexity of uh, having your views about basic things changed and especially about how undermining it is how, how totally demanding it is <laughs> to have to let go of your old securities and turn yourself you know towards the truth and like you're thinking what am i going to hold on to to secure that you used to secure your views by the fact that everybody else agreed with you and that made it seem pretty plausible suddenly you got to turn against all those things and do this on your own with slim slim evidence i suppose or slim support aside from you know your own grasp of certain certain truths or whatever and so let me add one more thing when he's talking about what it's like to challenge our deep held commitments he says a uh, 535 b and c he says it takes courage basically but he says about about what what people are like he says souls you know are far more likely to be cowardly in severe studies than in than in gymnastic uh, because the labor is closer to home in that it is the soul's labor privately and not shared in common with the body and he's talking about these you know these studies we're talking about the you know these uh, turning to these higher things uh, that involves the process of criticizing your older ways of living or older ways of thinking, those are things that hit you close at home. Right? You remember he said when he was talking about music back in book three, right? The music educates us in that most private and intimate part, right? And it's that it's that part that music touches so powerfully. Uh, of our deepest held sort of feelings. That's uh, what's uh, that's what's being threatened here and it's and he says it's hard to be courageous about those things it's easy to be cowardly so so that's more about the the drama the psychological drama of of turning of becoming educated of becoming a philosopher uh, but it's in relationship to that then that Socrates says an interesting thing uh, at 536 e he says the free man ought not to learn any study slavishly because he says no forced study abides in the soul so about this kind of education then um, about this kind of transformation you know he gave this image of someone pulling you out of the cave but that can't quite be right, right? this is something you can't actually be dragged to you can't be forced to do it uh, and that's related to a point he made a little bit earlier when Glaucon was asking him to tell him about what he had to study and so on at 533a he said you will no longer be able to follow my dear glaucon and what he meant by that is the thing we're talking about here is isn't something where you can be a passenger exactly you got to drive your own car right the the this is not a transformation that can be done by anyone other than you you are the one who has to make this kind of recognition uh, and so uh, just the last point about that uh, again at 537 uh, D he's he's talking about uh, dialectic and he's talking about you know, philosophical study and, and so on uh, he talks here about the person who is able to release himself from the eyes and the rest of sense but this notion of releasing itself he's saying you know one thing about certain kinds of study is that you are figuring stuff out for yourself not being forced by someone else to do something or, or you know you couldn't be forced but it's not a matter of somebody else trying to drag you somewhere it's a matter of you on your own you with your own initiative making recognitions and bringing about a transformation uh, so i wanted to highlight those that set of texts because it seems to me what you're really seeing throughout this discussion in book seven is that sort of uh, sort of the answer to that question like what's it going to take to talk to someone 
and tell them that they're wrong. Like you're looking at what it's like to be in the position of that person and what this what the challenges you are that that person which is to say you right what the challenges are a person is going to face in going through that process of transformation and especially emphasizing that this is the domain where nobody else can turn for you nobody else can do it for you at a, at a, at a certain level you got to do this on your own. You got to think for yourself. You got to make these recognitions for yourself. So I want to conclude just uh, by looking at a couple of other little passages uh, that again will have the effect of identifying some poor answering by Adamantus and Glocon. Uh, in that context of talking about, you know, someone coming back down into the cave once they've seen the light. Right. He says, you know, imagine that's you. Imagine you actually did that. Right. So what, what would you feel like when you're confronted with the games of this world where people get prizes for guessing what the shadows are like? Do you want to play those games? Do you want to win the honors and get the power in that thing? He says, uh, or rather, would that person be affected, as Homer says, and want very much to be on the soil, a serf to another man, to a portionless man, and to undergo anything whatsoever rather than to opine those things and live that way. And Glaucon says, yes, that's right. That's how he would feel, that second one. Um, so, you know, this is Socrates' story of the highest human pursuit that involves the real recognition of the ultimate nature of reality, the sort of imperative to represent that well. And in the context of Socrates, you know, trying to tell a story about that, you know, he identifies a very profound and crucial relationship, right? Which is the experience of the person who's, you know, seen seen something true in, in a world of, of prejudiced people who can't see that, right? And he's saying, you know, what's what's your perspective going to be like? And the the, there's an essential part of being, you know, the philosopher in that sense, or the good person, that is not wanting to win the prizes of that world. So he has this very nice quote from Homer that says that. So in other words, that quotation from Homer has really captured a profound moment in the human drama, in the drama of reality. But that's a passage that they purged from Homer at the very beginning of book three. Uh, Socrates doesn't say it here, but that's Achilles speaking. And that's what Achilles said in the underworld. And when he was talking with Adamantus at the beginning of book three, they said, well, we got to take out that passage where Achilles says this, right? Because that makes it sound like he's afraid of death. Whereas in fact, uh, Socrates is showing here on the contrary that that passage speaks to one of the most profound moments in the uh, successful uh realization of the human soul and its relationship to the divine so uh so one thing then that this shows is how wrong adamantus's answer was way back there okay point number one uh but now point number two i want to turn to what sort of comes up on the next couple of pages um because that's when uh socrates and glaucon first start talking about uh which which studies might uh, be suitable for helping someone make this sort of change. And he says, uh, this is at 521C. He said, do, do you want us to consider, you know, how a person like this is going to develop and what studies they'd have to go through? And um, Glaucon says, yes. And uh, he says, they, so we need some studies that have that power of, you know, turning the soul. Right? Well, as we know, that conversation is going to end up with talking about counting, he's going to find the simplest example you can think of, and it's going to say this does it. But but it's because it deals with number, right? Uh, but what comes before that are a bunch of studies that end up getting rejected by Glaucon. So he says, well, previously, you know, our, our men were educated by gymnastic and music. And Socrates says, and, and gymnastic, of course, is engaged with coming into being and passing away uh, for it oversees growth and decay in the body. Uh, and so he says, so, so that wouldn't be what we're seeking? And Glaucon says, no, it wouldn't. 
And Socrates says, okay, uh, and is music as we drive to, described it before? And Glaucon said, no, a study like that has nothing of this kind of thing we're looking for in it. Uh, and so that's why Socrates says, well, okay, if we can't have any of those, let's let's try, you know, the simplest thing of all that everybody uses, let's go to counting. Um, uh, what I want to draw your attention to is Glaucon's rejection of gymnastic and music. Um, and, and I repeat that, Glaucon's rejection of them. Right? It seems to me he's quite wrong about that. It seems to me that, you know, as Socrates goes on to say and show, what you're looking for is something that uh, that makes you think. You're looking for something that calls you to recognize the role of the noetic domain in your experience. Uh, and the particular thing he points to, you know, he says it's, it's something that, you know, points in two directions at the same time. Is this is this finger big or small? Oh, it's both. What am I going to do about that, right? Um, is something one or two? Oh, it's both. What am I going to do about that? Right? Well, you know, as I said earlier, uh, Socrates has already said that everything is ambivalent. That was the whole point of his discussion of the beautiful and the good. And, you know, this is like everything you ever deal with is a kind of contested domain between good and bad, just and unjust. And your job is to be able to recognize how a thing is good or how it is bad and to try to bring out the good in things and so on. Uh, but everything by itself is ambivalent. So there's, there isn't, you're never going to get a perfectly good thing, a perfectly just act, a perfectly beautiful thing. So everything is going to be both uh, one thing and its opposite. So according to the very definition he gave, everything in your experience is a summoner. So he, he said earlier, right, that, you know, if you're talking about just the recognition of a finger by itself, that, that might not automatically work because he says in all these things the soul of the many or you know the soul of most people is not compelled to ask the intellect what a finger is yeah sure the soul of most people isn't but certainly someone like socrates is compelled to ask that right so that you know the other things were ruled out there not because they don't really do what socrates says but because people t tend not to think about it right well so similarly here Socrates has shown that everything is is something that can provoke provoke this kind of reflection P people might not automatically notice it but that doesn't mean it's not that kind of thing uh, so I, I want to bring that out partially to underline again that we're being led by Glaucon's answers that are not satisfactory but also to remind you that this summoning we're talking about is something we should be able to find in other places I've given various examples uh, throughout this lecture. Uh, but I especially want to turn to the thing they rule out here, you know, music. I mean, maybe we could do it with gymnastic too, but I'm just going to turn to music for the moment. Music, or, or more broadly, just the domain of the muses, uh, seems a pretty powerful example of the thing he's talking about. What, and what I'm thinking about there is precisely poetry. What do we see from the very beginning with Socrates' relationship to that quotation by Simonides? He said, well, this must be true because it's a wise man who said it, but I'm not sure what he means. And, you know, the way Socrates related to Simonides' uh, remark that, that Polemarchus uh, presents, that it's just to give to someone what is owed, uh, took it up by saying, well, I, I, there's a tension here because I think it must be right, but it seems to mean this. How, how can we make sense of that? And he precisely treated it as something that was summoning him to thought. You know, I made the same point about Socrates' relation to what the Delphic Oracle said, no one is wiser than Socrates, you know, where Socrates experienced that as him being confronted with a kind of contradiction, and his whole life was devoted to figuring that out, right? That was the most profound summons. So I think Socrates has, in fact, made it very clear that the domain of poetry is the domain of the summons. Uh, I, I bring that up right here because I wanted to connect it with that very remark about that line from Homer that Achilles utters, right? You know, we, we've just seen that you could just bring out of that piece of Homeric poetry that they purged profound insight into the nature uh, of our human situation, our situation in reality. Uh, so I think the discussion throughout the rest of book seven about the nature of the summoners is amazing uh, but that notion needs to be taken out of the context the very narrow context in which it's taken up by glocon 
and brought into relationship to all the other things we've been talking about, we mustn't be blind to the implications of what Socrates is saying, uh, even if Glaucon is. Thank you.